I didn't know much about hotel amenities until I read an article this week that kind of intrigued me, piqued my interest a little bit. When you think about the amenities at different hotels, I was shocked to hear what the first one was the most widely used. It came in at 86% of the people who stay in hotels use these. Now, in the United States of America, there are about 6 million hotel rooms. Well, of those 6 million hotel rooms, about before the pandemic, at least, 3.3 million rooms were used every day. Of the people using those, the number one amenity, 86% of the people use those. The second most used was 84%, and that was the internet. You drop down to about 36% of the people use the hairdryer, and 28% of the people use valet parking. But at the top of the list was soap. I don't know what you think about hotel soap. Some people hoard it. Some people will rob the mage carts. I've seen it happen before. I've even done it myself on rare occasions. There are organizations in this city that ask people to collect and save their hotel amenities like shampoos and lotions and soap and toothpaste. And if you get a little sewing kit for the homeless people and they'll distribute those. But there was a man named Sean Siebler and Mr. Siebler was a, a road warrior. He traveled 150 days a year and he discovered through some of his reading, that 9,000 children under five years old will die every day because of hygiene-related illnesses and diseases. And if they just merely had soap to wash their hands, it would save half of their lives. That meant if he could get soap out of the garbage into the hands of people in third world countries, those children, he could save 4,500 children's lives every single day. When he got back, he'd been thinking about this. He'd, on the plane, he'd been writing on the napkin and running the numbers and thinking, how can he do this? Well, he, he, he got an idea. He went to the Holiday Inn in Orlando, Florida, where he lived. He met with the manager. He said, hey, I'm trying to round up soap. Is there any possibility you could help me with this? And the manager said, yeah, sure. Gave him a great big, huge bag of used soap. One of the things that had happened while he was on this trip and he was getting this revelation, he was back in his room after a hard day's work and he'd had several room service cocktails. And he called back to room service because they were the only ones still up that late at night and said, hey, what do you do with your soap? And they said, Mr. Siebler, would you like another cocktail? And he said, no, no, no. I absolutely want another cocktail. But please tell me what happens to the soap that has been used in his hotel? And the lady said, well, it goes in the trash and all of our trash goes to the local landfill. So his little wheels are turning. He gets back to Orlando. He goes to the Holiday Inn. The manager gives him soap had a good, warm reception of him. He went to six more hotels. They all said, yeah, you can have our soap. He started putting a nonprofit together. He got in touch with Bill and Linda Gates. He applied for their grant. He just knew they were going to send him a check for a million dollars and congratulate him on saving all the lives of these children. And within eight hours of the time he applied, they responded and said, we've rejected your idea and please do not reapply for another three years. That didn't stop him. He got some buddies together. They got a single car garage. They set it up as their shop. He supplied them with pickle barrels to sit on, potato peelers to scrape the, the sides off of the used bars of soap. He had a gr meat grinder that he'd run the bars of soap through, grind it all up, and then put it in some Kenmore crock pots, melt it down, pour it in the molds, and they got up to being able to do about 500 bars of soap a day. And they started distributing to third world countries. His organization grew. He called it Clean the World. Today, 8,000 major hotels supply him with their used soap every day. It goes all over the world. He literally is saving the lives of about 4,500 children under five years old every day. I thought about this and I thought so many times that soap in hotels is nice. We like it. We're glad it's there, but we don't pay much attention to it. That happens to us with the Holy Spirit of the living God. 
Charles Stanley said in a video I watched yesterday, he said, the Holy Spirit is one of the most untaught topics in churches today because so many people just don't really understand about it. They don't realize the Holy Spirit is a person, is a living being, is God. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. We're going to backtrack and pick up verse 4, which we talked about last week, and get us into verses 5 through 11. What you're going to see in the scripture today is that we're called not to walk by the flesh, but to walk according to the Spirit of God. And to walk according to the Spirit of God, we have to set our minds on the Holy Spirit. We have to release the life of Christ that's within us, and we will be in God's perfect peace. It's very well worth the efforts we go to. So in Romans chapter 8, backing up to verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, you're in the spirit. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I get excited about this. I think about living life according to the spirit. You only have two options here. You're going to live it according to the flesh, which is your sin nature, or you're going to live it according to the spirit. Jesus polarized everything into two simple forms. There's a continuum in John 10.10. 10, it says the thief, the devil, comes only to steal to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly, have it to the fullest. So you have these two forces. You're going to serve one of them. As Bob Dylan, the singer-songwriter, said, you got to serve somebody. It's going to be one or the other. Just imagine if you were going to the parking lot today and you felt a hard knock in the back of your head and you woke up, you didn't know where you were, you were in a dark dirty room, you knew your clothes had been taken, you'd been beaten, and you'd been raped. That's a good picture of what Satan does. He comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He hates you. He loves to create pain in your life. But you've got Jesus who loved you enough to die for you who came that you might have abundant life. When I put it this way, it's a pretty easy choice, isn't it? However, Satan is really good at sales and marketing. He can prevent a very convincing case, and he does every day. So as we learn to live or walk, that Greek word there is peripateo. It's translated live. It's also translated walk. So if you live or walk according to the Spirit, three good things are going to happen to you. I like the word walk because when you think about walking, the only way you can walk is one step at a time. If you're not taking one step at a time, you're not walking. You're doing something else. I can hop. I can jump, but I'm not walking because if I'm walking, it's only one step at a time. So as you walk in the Spirit, it's step by step. The first thing you have to do is set your mind on the spirit. 
Have you noticed what people set their minds on? I remember back to college days, our mind was set on our fraternity and the girls in the sororities we were interested in and the next party and the next formal. And we set our minds on those things. We thought about them all the time. What's your mindset on? Is it surviving from day to day? Is it just getting your job done? Is it your agenda? Is it your calendar? Is it your list? Or it's the things of the spirit. And you may be busy. You may be thinking, I don't have time to do any more than I do. And I spend 30 minutes with God every morning. I go to church on Sundays. I come on Thursday mornings at 10 o'clock. I don't have time for anything else. A miracle will happen. As you start making more time for God, he will make more time for you. You've probably heard you can't outgive God. That's true with money. That's true with service. It's also true with time. And so as you set your mind, things start to happen. In Isaiah, the 26th chapter, I love what the prophet said, gives us some clues about setting our mind. Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, whose mind is set on you because he trusts in you. This is a principle you've heard many, many times from me before. And I made a decision 21 years ago with Bible studies. And these have been going on for a long, long time. In fact, the first song I played today, that was Kate Miner. She used to be our worship leader when this Bible study met at Munger Place Church in the balcony. And beautiful voice. She used to do 15 minutes of worship with her guitar when we started every day. It was wonderful. But I made a decision about 21 years ago when I started a men's group at 6.30 every Thursday morning. I had a choice. I can show up with something new and fresh every single week and impress them with my ability to find new things to talk about. Or I could come down to the absolute basics that I think are important for living a good life. A lot of those basics come from 37 years as a psychologist, seeing what works for people, what doesn't. And I've chosen to just continuously hammer down the same old things again and again and again. And friends, when you got it, you don't have to come back here again. You've graduated. You can actually graduate when you get the basics down. And you won't need to come back. But most of us need to be reminded every single week some of these basics. One of those basics is we think about in Hebrews, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. That's one of the times where God is saying, look at me. You go throughout the Old Testament. He's constantly saying to people, Lift up your face, lift up your eyes, lift up your heads, lift up your countenance. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Hey, 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 look, look at me up here. Look at me, look at me. That's what God's saying all day long. Look at me, look at me. But Satan says, Oh, look at that. Oh, my. Oh, 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 that, oh I got to give that some immediate attention. Everything's coming in. We have a pandemic, we have a coronavirus, we have a mutant of the coronavirus, we have vaccines that are worse than the virus. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we doing? We're looking at all the problems rather than looking at him fixing our eyes on him, the author and the perfecter of our faith. So that's one of the things when you set your mind on God, that means you think about him more. What if you thought about God a thousand times more today than you did yesterday? Doesn't that sound overwhelming to think about God a thousand times? The average person thinks 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. I'm going to guess that you guys who are able to be here on a Thursday morning at 10 o'clock are probably smarter than the average person out there. I really think you are. You're successful people. You're educated people. You think even more thoughts than that. So when you got 60 to 80,000 a thousand's not much. You're thinking about one thought a second. What you thought about God. When you start walking in the Spirit, such cool things start to happen for you. 
this morning at the 6.30 Bible study, we meet them in their, their community hall in there. And the guy that hosts Zoom for us is a very devout, serious Christian. And he's sitting back there. He's intently watching me. He's listening to the lesson. He's taking notes. And this thought comes to mind. He recognized it as God. And God said, why don't you empty your pockets? You'd be more comfortable. Well, he's never emptied his pockets in Bible study before. I've never emptied my pockets in Bible study. I've never thought about emptying my pockets in Bible study, so I'd be more comfortable. But this weird thought comes, he empties his pockets, and in the last handful, there were his keys, and there was the church key. He got here at six in the morning to go around to go to the lockbox to use the combination of the lockbox to get the key out, to walk back around to the store, to let himself in, to turn off the alarm, to set the chairs up. And he just put it in his pocket and he forgot to take it back. Because the Holy Spirit reminded him, it saved him a trip from his office in the Princeton Center all the way back down here to return the key so the next person that comes after hours can get into the church. That's how cool God is. When you're walking by the Spirit, He will remind you. He will coach you. He'll tell you what to do. He'll make your life easier. I look at what was happening this week. You know, when you've been teaching the same group of people the same Bible for 21 years, you're always looking for new stuff. I was with a client on Monday, and he's a golfer. He's a scratch golfer. He'd gone to the University of Texas, was on their golf team many years ago. He keeps up with golf. I don't keep up with golf. Don't give a rip about it. It's way too slow for me, and I'm not any good at it. That's probably the bigger factor. And so I don't play golf. I don't keep up with it. But he was telling me about Scotty Scheffler. I didn't know who Scotty Scheffler was. He said he went to Highland Park High School went to the University of Texas. He won his first PGA in February. He went to the Masters this year, and he won the Masters, and some people are proclaiming him the best golfer on the planet. Well, golf is not his number one thing. God is his number one thing. I was visiting with Scott this morning before the Bible study started, and Scott's in Highland Park. I said, do you know Scotty Scheffler? And he said, I do. And his sister-in-law, married to his wife's sister, taught my daughter in school. And he's the real deal. Now, here's a man that sets his mind on God. Let me read you some things that he and his wife had to say. Can you imagine what it's like to be 25 years old, playing in the Masters golf tournament with guys that have been on the circuit for five, for 10, for 15, some of them 20 years. They're pros. They're seasoned. He went through that tournament. At one point in time, he had a six-point lead. Then some things went wrong. His caddy helped him work through the hard times. He got back up to just down one, he was down to one point lead and he came back up to win it by a three point lead. That's high pressure. Every single shot counts, very high pressure. He met his caddy, Teddy Scott, in a Bible study. He met his wife, Meredith, in a Bible study. He's got a good wife. There's some things they, they say that I, I just want to read to you. This is what it's like when you set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Like Meredith, my wife, told me this morning, she says, if you win this golf tournament today, if you lose this golf tournament by 10 shots and you never win another golf tournament again, she goes, I'm still going to love you. You're still going to be the same person. Jesus loves you and nothing changes, Scheffler said. And all I'm trying to do is glorify God. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm in this position. The golfer shared that Meredith prays for him before he steps onto the golf course every day. Every day when I go out there, Meredith always prays for peace because that's what I want to feel on the golf course is peace and have fun 
and just feel his presence, he added. So that's her prayer every day. That's my prayer. And I really felt that today. I felt at peace. Meredith helped him overcome feelings of being overwhelmed and unready for the game ahead. My wife told me, who are you to say that you're not ready? Who am I to say that I know what's best for my life? Scheffler shared. What we talked about is God is in control and the Lord is leading me. And if today's my time, then it's my time. That's where we're going. Here's a guy, you see the rich blessings of God on him. 25 years old, number one golfer in the world. But golf is not his major focus. It's glorifying God. Doesn't matter what your job is. Doesn't matter if you have your own business, your own career, your stay-at-home person, your retired person. You don't know what you're doing. You're, you're wishing God would show you what. It doesn't matter wherever you go, you carry the kingdom of God. You carry the life of Christ. You carry the peace of God. You are the light of the world. And when you start functioning that way, it's just so much fun. So the first thing we set our minds, well, what does it mean to set your mind on the things of the spirit? Well, if you think and feel the things of the spirit, that's a pretty good start. And you just decide you know, I've, I've studied goal setting. I used to be a big goal setter. I've got questions about goal setting. And the self-help industry would probably tell me I'm wrong because they like you to set goals. But I've often seen more bad feelings come from set goals than good feelings. Because until you reach those goals, you're feeling, I haven't succeeded. I'm failing. I'm failing. I'm not there yet. So what if rather than setting tangible goals, you set Holy Spirit goals? What if your goal was to go through today feeling good? Working with people for the last 37 years, every single client I've ever had without exception comes to me for exactly one same reason. Bottom line, everybody would like to feel better. Some people want to feel better about their marriage. Some want to feel better about their career. Some want to feel better about their relationship with God, their relationship with their children. Everybody wants to feel better. So what if you just chose to feel better and feel the way God wants you to feel? You look at the fruit of the Spirit. There's a whole lot of emotion in those. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What if that was your goal, to go through the day feeling that way? It's going to be a good day. It's going to be a real good day. What if you went to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, and you decide you're going to think the way God tells you to think? And he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, Anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Think on such things. I love how my girlfriend still to this day talks to her children that are some of them in their 40s, approaching 50s. She talks to them. She still reminds them as she did when they were children. Think happy thoughts. Think happy thoughts. Well, you don't want to hear that when you're angry and you're just seething. But it's a good thing. Think happy thoughts. Feelings follow thoughts. So when you set your mind on the spirit, you set yourself, your mind on the thoughts and the feelings of the spirit. I shared with you for the last several weeks what Joseph Benner said. He said, if you'll just learn these two simple phrases and think them every day, you'll see your life begin to change. I thought, eh, I don't know about that. But I like some of his other writings. I thought I'd give the guy a try. So I memorized this very simple statement. God loves me and cares about me and is giving me all good things. I love God, only think his thoughts, 
and only do what he wants me to do. That'll change your life. It really will. Especially when you see the contrast, because I realized, you know, in traffic, I think the thought that I just had probably was not the thought of God. When you've got something to contrast it, it, it gets very clear to you. And then when you think, I will only do what God wants me to do. Well, I know beyond a shadow of doubt, he doesn't want me to be unforgiven. He doesn't want me judgmental. He doesn't want me staying angry. So just with that, that's setting my mind on the things of the spirit and life gets better. The next thing we see in this passage is he says in Romans, If I can find myself in the right chapter here, it helps a lot. Verse 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So we set our minds on the spirit and then life comes. It's the life of Jesus. You're supposed to do what Jesus did. In Matthew chapter 10, I like where... Matthew goes with this. Jesus is talking. He's talking to his disciples. This is early on. Matthew chapter 10, we'll start in verse 5. It says, these 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritan, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 7, and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, if you blinked, or if you shuffled a little bit, you just missed the whole sermon there. That was really quick. That was short. He gave them their message. Did you catch it? He says, go proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he gives them instructions. After they've proclaimed the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals for your staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. Bill Johnson is one of my heroes. He's the pastor of Bethel Church in Redding, California. He's all over the world all the time. And as many miracles and supernatural wonders follow him as anybody I know of. When he's at home in Bethel, multiple healings take place. They've done a good job with medical documentation. It's just a supernatural, miraculous kind of place. I think he's totally, completely sold out to setting his mind on things of the spirit. And he says, you are the body of Christ. That means God is incarnating through you when you let him. Jesus was 100% sold out. And so he is God incarnate. We have our moments, but it's so much fun when you have your moments and you can represent Christ to people because he's going to shine through you. This is a lot to wrap your heads around that Jesus wants to live his life through you. John kind of understood it. He said, I have got to decrease and he's got to increase. Well, that didn't sound very good to me for several decades. I didn't like it at all. I don't want to decrease. I want to increase. I don't like that. I don't want to die. I don't want to be crucified with Christ. I'd rather live my life and live it as good as I possibly can. However, I'm starting to catch on. When he said, I must decrease, the part of him was the flesh. It was the sin nature. It was the part of him that was opposed to God that didn't abide by the laws of God that got him in trouble and caused him heartache and sadness and pain all the time. I about decided, yeah, I think I'm kind of ready to let that go. I was talking to a very, very spiritual friend on Monday. 
And we both kind of realized we've come to that place in life where we're just tired of worrying. And we're tired of trying to control everything that happens in our life every day. And we just kind of simultaneously came to the conclusion, I think I'm just going to let it go and trust God. Duh. It only took me 68 years to get there. And I don't do it every day, but I've realized more and more all the time, this is setting my mind on the things of God. No matter what happens, no matter what comes undone, it's like, I'm not going to worry about that. God will handle it for me. He will take care of that for me. Spent nine and a half years at Lake Point Baptist Church. We did all things well. It was the fastest growing Southern Baptist Church in the state of Texas, two different years. We were on fire. But as I think back on those days, what I remember is all the things that we did well. We built a great Sunday school division. We built a network of 150 small groups. We had something for everybody in the church. We had excellence. I mean, when you walk into our church on Sunday morning, there would be flowers in the restrooms. There'd be ice in the urinals. Why? I don't know. We saw it in a high-end restaurant. We thought, well, let's do it at church. It's cool. People think we're classy. But I mean, we were always striving for excellence. We worked hard all the time, and we went to the best we could. But as I started branching out and started my own ministry and realized I don't have the resources, I can't do that stuff. But God can. The things that are the most miracles memorable are the things God did. I love that. I love to watch God do stuff. Last night, I probably see miracles several times a week. To me, this is a miracle. Last night, teaching a Bible study, about 25 or 30 people on Zoom. Many of them, I don't know who they are. I don't know where they came from. I don't know how they heard about us. I don't know how they got in there. Just don't know anything at all. There was a young lady, and she had Two names, probably a first and a middle name. That's all I knew about her. Never seen her before in my life. And as I was doing prophetic ministry during the worship time, I was saying, God, you got anything for these people? I'd written two or three things down. And I came to her, and I felt like God said something about healing. I don't know what about healing. I just said something about healing. I said, well, God, what I do with this? He said, share it with her. I said, well, can you help me a little bit? He said, yeah, yeah, let's dress it up a little bit. Since you don't know whether she's going to be healed or whether she's going to heal somebody else, why don't you just tell her, I don't know exactly what this is about, but you're going to win either way. If you get supernaturally healed, you win. If you get to heal somebody else, you win because you're going to reap what you sow. So it's coming back to you. So you can't lose here. I thought, okay, that's going to encourage her, comfort her, build her up, and strengthen her. It fits the guidelines. Okay, I'll share that. I share that with this person I know nothing about, and then I finish. Somebody else is sharing some things prophetically on the Zoom call, and I glance down. It says there's a chat. Well, I've never done this before. I'm technologically challenged, if not incompetent. But I clicked on this and it popped up and she, and it was her. And she said, thank you so much. The biggest desire of my heart is to be able to lay my hands on people and heal them. I didn't know that, but that was God using me to let her know I've heard your prayers and I'm having somebody tell you it's coming to you. I think that's a miracle. I love stuff like that. I don't care whether I'm on the giving or the receiving end when God's doing something. It doesn't get any better than that. The best experiences of my life, and seriously, I've lived a phenomenally favored, wonderful, privileged, blessed life. There's been nothing that comes close to something happening with God. God really starts to be fun, starts to be helpful. He'll remind you in the middle of a Bible study, take the key back so you don't have to come back later. He'll tell you things you couldn't possibly have known unless he told you and it helps somebody else. God is so much fun. And that's what releasing the life of Christ is all about. 
So we're supposed to do the things that Jesus did, and it's the Holy Spirit who empowers us to do that. I probably have less than a 10% success rate at healing people, but I'm still trying. I still pray for people. And when I think, okay, so let's say I've got 5%. If I pray for 100 people and five get healed, that was well worth the effort. That's worth 95 failures to see people were actually healed. And if what I understand about scripture and stewardship is true, if God leads us to do something and we continue and we practice, he's going to bless us and we're going to get better and better and better and better and better. I spent three and a half years of my life doing nothing except casting demons out of people. Wore me out. I was so glad when God let me move on from that. <laughs> had people throwing up in my house. I mean, it was wild. It was wild. It was hard. But some of those people are still living free today, many years later. That's fulfilling. That's satisfying. That makes a big difference. The last thing we come to as we look at this is peace. You're going to have life and peace. So in Isaiah 26, 3, I already read that to you. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I think Philippians 4, 6 is a good place to start with peace. Most of you probably know that. It's a formula for peace. When you're not in peace, go to Philippians 4, 6 and do what it says to do. It starts out with be anxious for nothing. Some of your translations say do not worry about anything. But in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's a formula for peace. Then you read down the next verse. That was Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You come to verse 8. It tells you what to think about. Finally, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, think on such things. Then you get the next verse, and it's about the God of peace. So we've moved from the peace of God to the way we should think to the God of peace. When you think the way God tells you to think in verse 8, you're going to get the God of peace. And the God of peace will be within you. So now you've got up here. Six and seven, the peace of God. Verse nine, the God of peace. Verse eight, how to think. If you want to sandwich yourself between the God of peace and the peace of God, think the way God tells you to think. That's what I'm starting to do. When I start to get worried about things and feel like life is spinning out of control, it's like, eh, I don't want to worry about it anymore. I'm just going to let God handle it. He says, okay, I got it. It's that simple. This is about trusting God. This is about the peace that keeps coming. You look at Scotty. Yeah, thank you. The, the golfer. You look at him. You look at his wife, Meredith. You look at their caddy, Ted. They trust God and they pray for peace. And they value peace. I would define peace for you as an absence of bad feelings. Lots and lots and lots of people are spending lots of time and money and energy in counseling and on medications because they are looking for peace. You don't have peace when you're depressed. You don't have peace when you have anxiety attacks or panic attacks. Those are bad feelings. When you're at peace, you don't have any bad feelings. That's what I love about the kingdom of God. It's righteousness, peace, and joy. Peace, absence of bad feelings. It usually precedes joy, which is an overwhelming sense of well-being. And the Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So we look at this in life is really, really good. Now I'm going to jump back and I'll wrap it up with this. Matthew 10, we talked about go out. And as you're going, tell people the kingdom of God is here. It's at hand now. Heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, do the miraculous stuff, 
as you're going. You read on down, it said, when you go into a house, greet the house. I don't have a clue what that means. Do you? You walk in the house, I guess it has to do with the people and the spirits are in that house, but I'm not sure what that means. But what I do understand is it says, if you find it worthy, let your peace rest upon it. And if not worthy, let your peace come back to you. Think of peace as the Holy Spirit. Think of peace as an entity. Think of peace as a psychological commodity. But it moves, and it's looking for a place to rest. So we go all the way back to the days when times are worse. Say that again. Sorry. I couldn't hear what you said. This fine man loaned me his watch. Because <laughs> when I saw him today out on the sidewalk, I said, I'm in trouble. Two watches stopped. I picked up my other brown watch today. I'm sorry for a black watch with this shirt. It's kind of a faux pas. But I had my brown watch on today. And as I, I looked at, I had another brown watch, my wooden watch, which I really liked that a lady's Bible study given to me. It had stopped. So I dug this one out, put it on, and realized after the second Bible study, it had stopped too. So I told him, I'm in trouble. These poor people are going to be here till three or four o'clock today. Because And he quickly said, here, take my watch. He's so generous and gracious. And I, I said, I don't know if I know how to operate it. But he told me, just push that button and it'll make it work. I didn't know it was going to talk to me. It jiggled me a couple of times. People are looking for you today, I think. I'm not sure. So anyway, I was talking about something spiritual. We're talking about peace. And going back to days that were worse than these days. These are probably the worst times we've experienced in our lives. With the pandemic, with the unrest, being on the verge of World War III. All those things, but it's not nearly as bad as it was in the days of Noah. And we go back to the days of Noah and after the flood and after everybody on the planet had been totally, completely wiped out and destroyed, it's just Noah and his family and the animals in the ark. And the ark came to rest and he looked out the window. The rains had stopped, but the earth was totally covered with water. And he sent out a dove. Now, doves and pigeons have phenomenal homing devices. I mean, you've heard of homing pigeons. I used to use them for communications back in World War I and II. You could take them in a war zone with cannons and machine guns firing through the air all around them, and they always found their way home. They just don't have a tendency to get lost. So he releases a dove, and it flies, and it comes back. He drew the conclusion. It came back because there was nowhere for it to land. And so seven days later, he sends a dove out again. And the dove circles the earth. It flies around and it comes back. But this time it's got a sprig. It's got a leaf. It's got a branch in its mouth. Now, that is the internationally understood symbol of peace. A dove with a branch in its mouth. So he sends out the second dove. Comes back with a branch, but it didn't stay. There was nowhere for it to land. Sends out a third one seven days later. It doesn't come back. He knows the dove found a place to roost. The waters are subsiding. And soon he and his family and the animals and every creeping thing and every crawling thing was able to come out of the ark and repopulate the planet. You see this principle. Peace is looking for a place to rest. Isaiah 64 verse 1. The prophet Isaiah said, rend the heavens, tear open the heavens, rip the heavens, and come down. A lot of scholars think that Isaiah's prayer was answered four or five hundred years later when Jesus came at his baptism and the heavens, the clouds opened and the Spirit of God descended on him in the form of a dove. And the Gospel of John says, and it remained. So as we think about the peace of God, it's something you can give to other people. You think about the comforter. The word used here is the paraclete. 
It means comforter. It means advocate. It means helper. And people desperately need peace. And you are the carriers of God's peace. Be aware Determine if a person or a situation is worthy to give your peace to. And if they'll receive it, let them have it. God will give you plenty more. You won't lose anything, but they will have the peace of God that will help them greatly. Or it can return to you. So Jesus, think about this. If a white dove flew into this sanctuary and circled, and everybody's totally mesmerized with this white dove that got in the temple within. Surely the Spirit of the Lord is in this place, and it comes in, it lands on my shoulder. I'm going to be exceedingly careful and reverent and quiet. I don't want to spook it. I don't want to scare it away. So if I want to look, I'm going to turn very, very slowly. If I move, I'm going to be aware of what is resting on me. I don't want to disturb it. I don't want it to go flying away. I want it to remain. I want it to stay. If you choose to walk according to the Spirit, that peace will stay on you. It's capable for you to live a life of peace. I can tell you from my own personal experience, things that used to upset me for months at a time, Finally got it down to weeks at a time and then days at a time. And most things I can work through, even if they're really bad, in a matter of hours or less. And a lot of stuff, it's like, oh, well, God will handle it. And that's the end of that. The peace remains. God's peace wants to remain on you. Three things. Set your minds on the things of the Spirit Release the life of Jesus. Let him live his perfect life through you with his wisdom, with his power. It's going to make you look better than ever. And stay in that peace, that absence of bad feelings. There's no worry. There's no anxiety. There's no fear. There's no unforgiveness. There's no judgment. There's no bitterness, no resentment. It's a wonderful way of existence. And it belongs to you today.